All right, guys, let's take a look at this week's internet weather. These are the top 10 most probed ports for the past seven days. Uh, taking a look at the list, we have a few moving parts, moving uh, numbers, so we'll, we'll cover those in a second. But to review, at the top of the list, unchanged, port 23 TCP, which is Telnet. And second, we have ICMP, generally that's, that's ping. Uh, third place, TCP 22, that is SSH. Uh, 6379 is in fourth place, that is Redis, which is an in-memory data store. In fifth place, we have ADTCP, which is plain old HTTP traffic, followed closely by 443, which is HTTPS, and that's actually moved up three slots. In seventh and eighth place, we have 2375 and 2376, both of which are associated with Docker. In ninth place, 8080 TCP is an alternate web port sometimes used for proxies. And rounding out the top 10, 445 TCP, which is SMB, has moved up three slots since last week. So, Matt, does it make sense to drill into a couple of these here? You mentioned the Redis. So, uh, Redis being an, uh, basically an in-memory database, mm -hmm. how do folks typically use that? Why, why would somebody be scanning for it? Uh, good question. I think most of the time people are scanning for these sorts of things to either obtain sensitive data or mm -hmm. possibly as a possible um, as a, a way into the machine. And I'm not aware of any recent vulnerabilities in Redis, but if there's such was such a vulnerability that allowed you to say make a query against Redis uh, and throw some arbitrary code in there, this might be a way of getting arbitrary uh, code execution on the box, just as a, a precursor to doing other things on that machine. Yeah. So you know, we were talking earlier about um, you know information getting exposed through HTML client-side storage that looks like just you know another storage mechanism. The fact that this port would be exposed to the internet, I would expect it's an inadvertent exposure. And, mm -hmm. uh, or we'll say either inadvertent exposure or the uh, didn't realize that they were <laughs> yeah, <laughs> inadvertent infected. or ill-advised. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know these are the kinds of things that we should be checking for is to make sure that we understand what ports are open to any website or applications on the internet. And um, if if uh, if we don't do it as security practitioners, others certainly will do that for us. Sure. And uh, I, I know over the years we've repeatedly said to people, you know, if it doesn't have to be on the internet, just don't put it on the internet. Like mm -hmm. there are better ways of doing this. You know, if you need to have some sort of service remotely um, accessible, I mean, putting it on the internet with just a password is it's kind of okay, but generally if you can put a VPN in front of it or some sort of other uh, mechanism to control access to those services, we recommend that instead. Yeah, I'd take even a step further. Any Anything that's exposed with password only protection, uh, if you aren't really carefully monitoring and blocking password guessing attacks against it, uh, it's probably still pretty vulnerable. That is eventually, if there's no control put on there to pretend, present, prevent it, first of all, it's gonna, they're going to load down your website. <laughs> yeah. They're going to load down that interface to the extent possible and uh, continue guessing passwords or IDs until they get in, uh, among other research. So the other one you talked about here was the Docker. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be presumptuous, but uh, why Docker? Why Docker? Good question. Uh, so, Docker is a way of running software um, in a container, basically, which is to say sort of isolated from everything else. Some people use it as a security mechanism. Uh, I have a few friends who would say that it's not, that it's mm -hmm. it's probably just a little bit of uh, a deterrent and not really a way of, of protecting um, so much as separating. So, mm -hmm. in this case, why Docker? It's not really clear. Uh, it so could be possible. I'm sorry. Uh, Did you have sorry, something? Sorry, Matt. Yeah. So I know uh, some, 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 I'd say like sometimes mid 2021, we started seeing a lot of uh, ransomware uh, targeting Docker, like poorly oh. configured Docker instances. So I think that maybe, you know, I think there's been a couple of takedowns recently, and I think another ransomware gang just shut down. So I'm, you know, speculating, but maybe it's related to that. Okay. So you're thinking that these gangs are looking for it in order to, um, to take control of a Docker instance and hold some sort of critical service ransom? Is that right. maybe it? Right, potentially. Uh, I, yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, yeah. the, the other thing about Docker is that you can spin up new Docker containers within 
if, if you know it's running on a machine, you can sometimes ask it to go retrieve and run another container from a third party right. site. So if you wanted to run, I don't know, crypto mining uh, or or some other service that you wanted, maybe someone wanted to run a, a set of, uh, of proxies uh, on hardware that they didn't actually own and then try and resell that as a service. That's another possibility. I mean, I really don't know what the attack is here. I mean, we can only speculate without really seeing what's going on on, on a, a machine that's receiving this, t- this traffic. Um, but we can think of a couple possibilities. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and typically you would not expect these ports to be exposed. And, and it, I think this is what adds the additional challenge is using public cloud services. Uh, this is the kind of thing you want to control access to this, that is put uh, IP address restrictions on it so that they wouldn't be exposed to the general, and you're able to access it specifically from specific sources. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. All right, taking a look at the most sources probing. So this is the number of individual IP addresses trying to scan uh, a given service as opposed to the volume of scanning. Um, A lot of these numbers are going to be very familiar from the last chart. I'll skip over the first four because I've already read their names out. Uh, In fifth place, we have 5555 TCP. That is Android Remote Debug Bridge, which is sometimes enabled on Android devices, either intentionally by someone who's trying to, I don't know, sideload applications onto an Android-based TV system, for example, or sometimes uh, inadvertently if someone bought a device and didn't realize this was enabled. Um, skipping over 8080, in 1433 TCP is, I believe, MS SQL. Correct me if I'm wrong yes. on that. I know it is Sorry. a SQL. Cool. Um, Skipping over 22 TCP, uh, 389 UDP is LDAP, and then we have 139 TCP in 10th place, and that is NetBIOS, which is a name I haven't said in a while, which is interesting. That's up two spots. Yeah, that closer look. still exists. Uh, some of those older Windows machines are still hanging out there. And, um, you know, LDAP is similar, you know, the Redis type thing and exposure of potentially information to the internet through that interface. Uh, and similarly, the uh, 1433, again, database access exposed to the Internet and uh, probably not uh, protected well if it's uh, if it, that port's exposed. Sure. And I know for a fact that MS SQL has uh, commands that you can execute um, shell commands through that if it's enabled in the database. So mm-hmm. if someone finds a way to talk to that database and run XP command shell, um, they might be one step closer to actually getting access to the machine. Um, so taking a look at 139 TCP, this is a 30-day view. Uh, these spikes that you see, um, the major sources for all of these spikes are in the U.S. at a certain cloud provider, and they're usually about 100 uh, sources or so. Actually, no, I take that back. They're, they're more like 1,000 sources. Thousand. Or so. the, the spikes are 1,000, um, but the, the one cluster, I think, might have been about 100. So one-tenth of it is, is concentrated, and the rest of it is sort of spread out, I think is how to interpret that, that, that data. Yeah. Um, 443 TCP, which is HTTPS, um, you can see that I have a 30-day view here. We had some much higher spikes, you know, in previous weeks, but uh, the the spikes that we're talking about here in particular, the one on uh, the 11th of February is the highest one, which comes in around 500 500 million scan flows uh, per hour. And... These this spike is also again from a cloud provider in the U.S. happens to be the same cloud provider. Uh, I did not validate whether they were the same exact hosts, but someone seems to have an interest in scanning this port. Uh, 443, just like 80, is another one where it's it's hard to know exactly what kind of targets are being looked for here, just because there's such a variety. And on top of that, 443 is uh, encrypted traffic. So even if you <laughs> even if you had some of it to look at, you wouldn't really get anything out of it. Well, this could be as simple as uh, probing, looking for uh, dark websites, that is, ones that are not indexed otherwise, and so it wouldn't show up in a search engine or anything like that, but just browsing to a website that's mm-hmm. hanging out there. <laughs> you know, you, you reminded me of something. I was listening to um, the Risky Business podcast recently, and uh, Andrew Morris from Gray Noise was talking about scanning but not from a perspective of scanning by ip address but instead scanning across the space of possible host names with http and https requests uh, because you've got individual ip addresses that if you scan them on these ports 
it'll say, you know, we don't know what site you're looking for. But because they're shared hosting, as long as you give it the right host name, you can start hitting all sorts of sites that you wouldn't normally be able to reach by purely scanning by mm -hmm. the IP address. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Which was interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. So there's, there may be people out there doing that. In a, it's, oh, gosh, I'd love to see what that looks like. Um, just curious, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so 445 TCP, which is SMB, which we've talked about. Again, you see a couple of spikes here. It's a 30-day view. Again, those major spikes, a single cloud hoster in the U.S., same provider as the last two. Um, but again, I can't say for sure they're the same host, but you can see some significant interest on the 11th, on the 15th, and of course, uh, at the start of the month on the first or second there, I believe that's the second. Um, yeah, SMB is never going away, I think. That was, um, I remember when it was the the top port on the internet uh, during the WannaCry stuff, it seems to have calmed down significantly, uh, but still, still an interesting port to follow. And there's one I wanted to throw in simply because I saw it come up not on the top 10 list, but on the top 20 list. We actually pulled more than the top 10 each week. And this moved up 25 spots to the 18th slot. So I wanted to see port 2323 TCP, which is typically an alternate port for Telnet. Now, I'd heard of 2323 before. I wanted to know, is has this ever been seen before? How How big of a deal is this? And so when I originally pulled this chart, I pulled the last 30 days and I said, wow, look at that spike. That's tremendous. And then I pulled 365 and it, it's absolutely nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is a significant spike for the last 365 days. It's one of several smaller spikes. Uh, but back in, I want to say, yeah, back in late May of last year, there was an absolutely ridiculous spike of sources <laughs> scanning this. Wow. So I don't have the data for that one. Um, but somebody seems to be interested in it again. Um, but, I hesitate you know, to say why, but yeah, Matt, I, I seem to remember that this is one that was uh, used at least by some IoT devices and yep. potentially exposed. And so there has been sort of a, uh, a a group of activities scanning on those. I think it's always interesting to look at these, particularly the scan SIPs, because this is not just somebody going out and scanning. This is somebody that has botnet that's going yeah. out and scanning. And uh, so, you know, you're looking at thousands of addresses doing the same thing at the same time. That doesn't happen by accident. Uh, it happens because somebody has a set of resources. The fact that they have a botnet suggests, but does mm -hmm. not guarantee, that they might be trying to build up their botnet. <laughs> yep, that's true. And I, I see I left myself a note from several hours ago, which I've forgotten about. But yes, previously... Um, I had found some articles from previous years that this was one of the ports when Mirai first hit the scene that it was interested in as well. Whether that's definitely what's going on here or not, hard to say. Again, Mirai was one of those botnets that when it got too much attention from the authorities, they gave away the source code. So now there are m millions of mini Mirais, maybe not millions, let's say probably hundreds of mini Mirais out there uh, doing their own thing with the same sort of techniques of exploiting IoT devices uh, to grow the botnet. So, I agree. Just, it probably falls into that vein. Just like four, 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 five scanning. Yeah, Mirai is never going away. Mm -hmm. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an interesting thing about uh, what you just stated, because the source code source code was released, and there are probably a number of folks that are using that source code that perhaps don't even know why it scans particular things, mm -hmm. and they may not even be fruitful ports or methods, you know, exploits, but they're still in the code. And therefore, when they run the code, it does the scanning. And so there may be very little significance to the actual benefits that they get from that particular, you know, scanning particular ports. Uh, but because it's doing its thing, <laughs> it may have newer and other exploits that, uh, you know, we, we just haven't noticed in this context, but, uh, you know, mm. it's definitely out there. So it's, uh, you know, as things evolve and as code gets in the hands of folks that perhaps don't know so much about how it works or why it does particular things, they may have just left some garbage in there that uh, we have to wade through to figure out what's really relevant. Wow. That sounds like right. the perfect sort of thing to set up a honeypot for, though, doesn't it? Yes, it I does. <laughs>